So your latest album, Throne of Bones, it's very mature and diverse sounding. There's some jazz elements in it. It's it's all over the place in terms of genres, which I think is a good thing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of um, it's kind of like what what our name is about. Like um, when we started the band, we didn't really you know we didn't have a genre of metal that we wanted to to fit into. We kind of just said like we wanted to be a metal band, as in you know. Uh, can you really define the type of metal that Metallica are? Can you fully define what Machine Head are? And not really. So we were like, we just want to be a metal band, so we want no labels. So, um, yeah, Dead Label kind of, it, it seemed like a fitting, you know, title to not having one specific genre of metal that we fit into and also we got our name it was actually the name of a song which is a whole other thing about this this girl that got killed and stuff and um, but yeah the genre thing we we try not to to be too kind of caught up in a specific genre cool do you think that transcending genres is a good thing to help combat elitism because you know how some metalheads are like oh i don't listen to any of this type of metal or you know what i mean yeah absolutely like um we've we've come across a lot of that elitism uh throughout the years and um, you know like trash heads a lot of the time they'll only listen to trash and death metal people will only listen to death metal and um, I mean I'm probably guilty of it myself I you know I might not go check out a band if they were labeled as something that I'm not super into but um I, I think it's it's good that bands can take elements from genres that they like and make it into something new I think that's the only way of music will evolve you know and um, like if people keep writing the same trash album over and over again or people keep writing the same like you know doom metal album over again there'll be no nothing nothing growing in the in the scene so yeah i think it's really important you've opened for bands like machine head fear factory and gojira how did that come about and what was your reaction when you found out the news uh man the reaction every time is the same it's like the best day ever and <laughs> um, with each with each time we, we got that those uh those emails i actually remember where i was each time and uh it's usually myself who gets the contact email you know about those things because um i have the the band email on my phone so um i always get to tell the other two which is really fun for me and um, so with machine head i i absolutely freaked out and i just i rang them and told them and the same with gojira and um, we were unsure about the fear factory thing we were kind of in the loop but we weren't fully 100 percent confirmed for it for a while so we were waiting for like a week to find out whether we were confirmed and i finally got to do the, the prank i wanted to do and ring ring them and say oh i've bad news and they'd be like oh no we didn't get it i'd be like no we've bad news you have to tell your job you're not going to be in work for a <laughs> so, uh, that was really fun i finally actually took a breath to do the prank because the other times i was too excited but uh, i was i didn't hold it for very long i was like no i'm you know we're, we're going but um yeah the machine had gig well, God, that was years ago now, but we, the the guy that did, a friend of ours who did our first music video and he designed the artwork for our first album and our logo, um, Fias, he, he actually worked for Machine Head, um, for a long time, he toured, he, he's, he's a photographer, so, uh, he, he, when Machine Head booked Dublin, I think Rob contacted him and said, was there any good Irish bands he should check out? And he sent him our video, and uh, yeah, then we just got contacted by their booking agent. And that was awesome. With Gojira, I contacted the promoters here in Ireland who were running the gig, and uh, yeah, they just said yes. And then Fear Factory, it was just like a list of people recommending that we contact people, and uh, yeah, that one took a while to happen, but it happened, so it was really cool. Cool. Being yeah. from Ireland, do you guys feel you have to work harder than bands that are based in bigger music scene areas, like, say, London, for instance? 
Yeah, uh, so it has its pros and cons. Like, I think we do have to work a little bit harder to be considered for, like, local shows. For example, like, if there was three or four UK dates with a band, it would probably make more sense routing and business-wise for a promoter to put on a local band because they don't have to consider you know a band getting over there or whatever right. um, and especially like places like Los Angeles and stuff like there's so many good bands like there's so many good bands that it's hard to be seen or heard you know overall of that for opportunities the other side of it is the Irish thing kind of seems to work well for us people seem to just like Irish people and you know, uh, they kind of be a little, little bit interested in, in what it sounds like. I think some people expect us to sound like folk metal, which there is a lot of folk metal bands in Ireland, but not just folk metal bands. Right. So I think it, if you can get the attention of someone, they might give you a little bit more of a chance, like as in listen to more than 10 seconds because, because we're Irish. So pros and cons. And you can always travel. I mean, we can get to London pretty damn quick. So, uh, yeah, I think it's more of a pro. Cool. What was it like touring America and touring overseas? Oh, well, America was really cool. America was like, we were going over to record the album and we had 90 days on our visa. So the album only took like two weeks. Um, to record so we were like okay we'll book some local shows for the weekend but that kind of just turned into a full-on u.s north american <laughs> tour and um, it was just the way i mean like when you're like before we went there we really like you know no i think maybe one person might have heard of us seen our video in the states it was very like you know we didn't have any exposure necessarily and um, so I was just contacting people on Facebook to see about gigs and stuff like that. And we ended up actually meeting some incredible people, like really good promoters who gave us a chance. Again, I don't know if they just liked Irish people and that's why they gave us the time to check us out or whatever. Like we played, we actually played twice in Casper in Wyoming because the, the first time we went there, we had such a good show, the promoter invited us back on the same run. And um, we played two shows in Boston. They were incredible as well. Uh, yeah, just some really, really cool. Like we met some of the best people ever while we were there and we saw so much. I mean, it's kind of like driving on a continent you know, rather than a country because right. the states vary so much. I mean, the weather, one day we were in the Rockies and we were driving from the Rockies through to Arizona. So we actually saw snow and desert in the one day, right. which was just really crazy. And um, Europe is, is really cool. It's, it's a little bit more foreign than America in some ways because the language barrier, like in America, they speak English. You're always going to like the food in America if you're from Ireland. So it was easy. But um, in Europe, uh, it's like you could wake up in Germany and you can drive to Austria and France. And each day is different and the language is different and the right. rules are different and the food is different. But I like that. I think that's really cool because um, you really don't know what the day has in store. <laughs> um, and the, fa the fans in Europe, like people who go to metal shows in Europe are really cool they um they they really take their metal very seriously and uh, like sometimes you get like a whole kind of feedback you'd nearly get a review while you're standing at the merch stand from someone which i think is very cool that people take the time to come and talk to you about your set afterwards and stuff and then japan is probably the best place i've ever been in my life uh those people are nuts and they just really like metal and they don't care about anything and yeah it's crazy and awesome there <laughs> <laughs> what are some of your influences as a band um okay so the obvious ones are metallica keenhead gojira pantera and right. um, we listen to a lot of thin lizzy as a band we like when we're driving place and stuff we listen to a lot of thin lizzy um a little bit of simon garfunkel Jimi hendrix um, we were, we're always looking for new metal records and new stuff, but they would be the, the core, the core influences, probably Metallica, Machine Head, Gojira, I'd say. So what are some of your personal influences? Like who made you decide, oh, I'm, I'm going to play metal? 
for the rest of my life. Um, well, my first, my first drumming influence was actually, technically it was Travis Barker. He made me want to play drums. Um, and then as soon as I actually started to play, I heard Metallica and I saw them live and I was like, okay, I want to play metal. And then as soon as I was actually buying a double pedal, I heard the album Through the Ashes of Empire by Machine Head. And that just, from that day to this day, I want to play like Dave McLean. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I'm Mar- Mario from Good Year is a big influence of mine, but if I had to be a drummer, as in play exactly what they play, I'd be Dave 100%. I think he's the perfect metal drummer. He just decorates a song without overcrowding it, keeps it heavy. He's, he's got some really innovative styles, but w- without ever overdoing it or underdoing it. So he's, he's made me want to play metal drums for the rest of my life. So are the drums your first instrument or did you play any other instruments prior to that? Um, the drums is literally the only instrument I can play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like the only thing I can do. Um, I used to, before I took up drums, I used to do a lot of like drama and musicals and really nerdy cool stuff like that <laughs> um, but uh up until uh once i started playing drums that was that was like the only thing i've done since i think i played the tin whistle when i was really small for like a week but that's it women in metal usually go for vocals or a string instrument like guitar or bass do you think yeah. that being a female drummer has brought you some advantages or helped you stand out from your peers um I don't know, like I've I've met a few metal female drummers along the way and um, it's always kind of like seeing a unicorn because they're like, oh my <laughs> God, another one. And they're like the drummer from Nervosa, we played at a festival last summer in the Czech Republic and we were just instant friends because like you kind of have to be friends because yeah. there's so few of us. But uh, um, no, not really. I think like... Uh, sometimes people, when they see our picture or whatever, they probably assume I'm the vocalist until they listen to us, and then they they would they would know that that just had to be done because right. like, there's no way that could be me. And <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, at the beginning more so, like when we were when we were a little bit um, less, like when we had a few less miles under our belt, I think people were more intrigued by it, but. Now, we, we never wanted it to be the focal point of the band. Uh, like, I would like, you know, people to listen to the music and enjoy it. And then if, if they so happen to see afterwards that I'm a girl, that's cool. Like, I never, um, yeah, you know, this whole unique selling point crap. We, right. we just want the music to do the job. And if, it, if, it's, if it's good enough, it shouldn't matter to, to whoever's listening to it, whether I'm a girl or a boy. Having said that, we uh, sometimes people just kind of freak out about it, I guess. <laughs> but um, yeah, I've I've met. So I I actually think it would be harder to be a vocalist being a girl, uh, because you sometimes could be accused of being too sexy or right. you know like trying to sell it in a different way and like some girls are just really pretty and they happen to sing metal music and people are going to find them attractive and just because they want to sing doesn't mean they have to be unattractive you know it's this whole like bullshit sexist thing really and uh, there's some really cool girl string instruments as well like uh i think her name is like nita she plays alice cooper right she's probably like the coolest chick i've ever seen and it just it does not seem to matter that she's a chick at all and so that's kind of what i would like to do is like that it just doesn't matter that i'm a girl and so far it seems to work i do get the odd uh compliment that's an insult kind of thing you know oh you're really really good Good for for a girl girl. yeah (laughs) (laughs) and so i'm just trying to like you know, hit extra hard so that that, that doesn't uh, happen. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's the. I don't know if I answered your question at all there, but uh, they're my thoughts on the whole female drummer thing. <laughs> no, that was fine. Um, I actually interviewed Nervosa not too long ago, and oh, I cool. I spoke to Fernanda, who's the singer and the bassist, and she said that in the early days of the band, a lot of people in the scene would make up these rumors about them just because they were girls or whatever. Did you ever encounter that, even, like, when you were in school? 
Um, I don't think so. None that have got back to me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't think so. I think, uh, yeah, no, the, nothing, nothing bad like that. Like most anything like negative that I've, I've come into, it has always, I think their intention has actually been to compliment me. I've just taken it, you know, the offensive way. Right. Um, I've never, thankfully, I, I, not that I know of, I've never had anybody make stuff up or, or say anything bad. Um, that's come back to me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thankful for that. I guess because they're an all-girl band, maybe it's a little bit different for them because they're fighting all the stereotypes. Right. Yeah. You know, I've just got one. I've still got the whole, like, guy frontman, guy guitarist, and... Um, so it's a little bit less pressure on me than it would be on those. But I, I saw those those girls play and they fucking they would make anybody, you know, think twice about giving them any grief. So right. yeah, I'm glad they're doing as well as they're doing. You guys are on Nuera Records, which is kind yeah. of an unfamiliar label for most people. I mean, when people think metal they think nuclear blast, prosthetic, metal blade. How has it been working with that label? Um, good, yeah, like New, New Era is um, an independent label, so they are based in the United States, which is uh, which is why we got the opportunity to go record the album in the United States and stuff, which was very cool for us, like a really great opportunity. Um, it's been it's been good, yeah. Like we haven't met any problems with uh, people not recognizing the name. They they just they you know, once they check them out and they see that they're they're an actual label, they seem pretty pretty okay with it. Um, and it's a good label to be on. They're they're very helpful and they've got us, you know, an an album. The production on that album is, you know, has exceeded our expectations. Right. So yeah, yeah, no, it's it's been good. It's been good. What is your advice for aspiring musicians who are trying to get their name out there? Um, advice for inspiring musicians. I would say the main thing that you need to do is persevere. Like you will get a lot of no's before you get yeses and stuff like that, you know? Like you'll get a lot of um before you get the, to support a band you like or b- go on tour with a band you like, you're going to have to be turned down for about 50. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, another thing is a good music video, a good quality recording and a good music video because that's what people are, are judging you on. Um, you know, not the, the people that can give you a good gig aren't necessarily going to be at your local gigs. So you've got to present yourself the best you can and just keep plugging it and just keep asking people to check it out. And, you know, a lot of the time people are actually interested in listening to new new metal, you know, um, they, they want to hear an album. And if they like it, they'll probably tell their friends. So just keep plugging it. And if you meet some nasty people along the way that, you know, reject you just keep going and just wipe it off (laughs) that's the best thing i would say you mentioned that dead label refers to a girl who was killed i read in an interview that it was sophie lancaster yes yeah so basically because it kind of ties in with the name we have a song on our first album called rest in pieces um and that was the first song we wrote as dead label and um, it was just as the band formed there was a girl in manchester in england who was killed for being a goth and it, it kind of it affected everyone i think it affected a lot of people in our generation and younger and older because i mean it was the first time that somebody had been killed for you know just the way they dress i mean which is so awful and so horrible and um, so basically the lyrics are about like Dan is talking to the killers and saying, I hope you rest in peace. Um, like in peace, sorry, you know, because violence with violence or whatever. Right. Um, so we had the song was called Dead Label because she was killed because of a label. Um, and then when we talk, we're talking about band names, we were like, Dead Label as a band name would probably be better because it would fit the whole genre thing. Right. But So the song became called Rest, rest in Pieces, but it was originally called dead label um about about that girl so the song is is about her the people who murdered her and then what's funny is we actually played bloodstock festival last year we played the sophie lancaster stage and we were booked for that stage before the promoter knew about the the link because we don't advertise it too much because 
you know, we just wrote a song about it. Many, a lot of bands have wrote songs about that happening right. because I think it affected a lot of people who are into metal and rock because the goth side of things is always kind of, you know, it's all tied in together. It's a community and stuff. Right. So I think it's a, uh, it's important. A lot of people at that time were affected, and there's probably I know Delane have a song about Sophie as well, um, but uh, it's not something we we set like want to sell as such. You know, it's just right. it's a song that we have, and it's about that event. But uh, that's where the name Kate popped into our heads, anyway. Do you feel that metalheads and goths have been more accepted since then? Um, maybe. Maybe it's not so much exception, exceptions as it is that metalheads are more taking a much bigger stand against bullying within the community. I think, uh, like, I think I, I don't have the exact facts, but I'm pretty sure in Manchester there was a um, there was some sort of law brought in that, like, if somebody is shouting or you know basically abusing someone for the way they dress or the way they look, that it's against the law. Which I personally think it should be against the law everywhere, but right. it's actually like criminally an offence. Because I know when I was really young, a lot of the boys that I hung around with they, in their school, they got a lot of a lot of grief. Uh, for, you know, wearing spikes and, you know, having their hair in mohawks of, like, really bad, like, horrible bullying. Um, so I just think that maybe the metal community is standing up more. Maybe that since that awful event happened, that people are just, like, standing up to inspire other people to stand up and to be more of a community. That's the impression I get. Like, Bloodstock do a lot with the Sophie Lancaster Foundation, and I know the Il Mesca makeup, which is actually really nice makeup, but they they have a whole Sophie Lancaster uh, campaign as well, and there's the Sophie Lancaster Foundation. They that's run by her mother, and they go into universities and everything, and they they do a lot to promote the anti bullying. So I think it's it's a it's a really they've turned something horrible into something good, and I hope it just gives people the confidence to stand up against the bullying whereas maybe before people didn't have as much confidence to just say like look I have brothers and sisters in this metal world I don't need to take this shit you know right. <laughs> so I hope I hope what are your future plans for dead label um right now we are preparing to go and play at Metal Days, which is a festival that's in Slovenia. Um, so we're pretty excited because we've never been to Slovenia before. And this festival looks really cool. It's like a week. It's a week long. And we're on the last day, which is, is cool because everybody will either be like, you know, going all out because it's the last day. <laughs> um, and, and we're on the main stage which is really a big deal for us. Like any festivals we played with more than two stages, we've we've never been on the main stage before. So it's a pretty cool, cool thing for us to get to do. Um, after that, we kind of, we've some tours in the works, but nothing 100% confirmed yet. So um, I have nothing of like, I can tell you 100%. Right. <laughs> but we hope to be very busy. We hope to be very busy after Metal Days. Cool. I just wanted to ask you about more about your musical background. How many bands were you in before Dead Label? Ooh, um, okay, so the three of us were actually in a band previous to Dead Label t together with two other guys called VX. And uh, before that, myself and Danny were in a couple of other bands together. So there would have been, let me see, one, two, three, four, maybe five but I'm talking like teenage, you know, jamming in your shed, right. bands, playing like one show in Dublin sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, Danny has been in every band with me by my very first one. Um, and then Dan joined us in VX and he's still with us and hopefully forever will be. <laughs> cool. I noticed that in your songs, there's a lot of layers. There's a lot of guitar layers and stuff. How do you guys pull that off live? Um, well, with stuff like Ominous and Void, uh, it's it's actually just the way that Danny plays. He can make the sound um, 
with the guitar, he's just able to play super heavy. Um, he's, he's a hard hitter. We're all actually really hard hitters. Um, and it just translates. We've, uh, we've gotten good, good feedback about the live sound. I think uh, we don't do the layers like that you would the extra layers like overdubs or anything like right. that we just they we don't necessarily need them live and everything else it's just the two guys with the bass and guitar they just seem to make it work somehow <laughs> cool so is there anything else you want to say in the interview um i want to thank you for the awesome review you gave us a spectacular <laughs> review no problem um, so thank you thank you for that thank you for getting it you got the album you know you understood stood it so that's pretty much all we we wanted from people was that they they what we wanted to put out there translated because we were pretty nervous about the gates of hell and we were a little bit nervous about the cleansing that maybe it would seem out of nowhere to everyone else because it felt it felt to us that after playing playing those songs that it needed some sort of little kind of break to clean your palate so to speak and then you get back right into the heavy stuff but we weren't sure if that was just how it felt playing and if it would 100 percent translate for everyone listening and it seems to so far particularly your review so thank you very much